Go on to business now. Shell Pellegrin is with us. Uh, we're going to stay on this topic that we started the bulletin uh, with, of putting pressure on Iran with sanctions. One of Tehran's economic lifelines has been its oil exports, those already the target uh, of sanctions from the US, though, Shell. Mm -hmm. In uh, 2018, when former President Donald Trump pulled Washington out of the JCPOA, the international deal on Tehran's nuclear program, well, that basically reinstated a very wide net of U.S. sanctions on Tehran, which banned nearly all trade with the country. But that hasn't really been effective at stemming the flow of Iranian oil exports. A Rapidan Energy Group says that currently Iran exports 1.6 to 1.8 million barrels per day, which is not far off the amount exported before sanctions uh, were reinstated, which were at 2 million barrels per day. This is because people have found ways to evade these sanctions in spite of efforts uh, by the White House. Yeah, it does sound like the sanctions are not particularly effective there. But one way to increase the pressure on Iran would be uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, better target the people who actually buy its oil, especially a place like China. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that Iran has managed uh, to keep its oil exports at such a level is that it still has has an avid customer base among China's smaller refineries, known as teapot refineries. Chinese buyers represent 91% of all exports currently. Oil gets to these refineries thanks to a so-called dark fleet of older tankers that tend to switch off their transponders when they get to Iranian ports so as not to be detected. And on top of that, these exports are generally branded as being from third countries like Malaysia or other Middle Eastern nations. A bill currently voted by the House of Representatives in the U.S. is attempting to expand sanctions against Chinese financial institutions that buy this Iranian oil. So why is the uh, Biden administration then reticent to increase uh, sanctions to a new level? Well, there are two main reasons for that. First off, the White House is eager not to further rise already high tensions with Beijing. The two countries are opposed on many different fronts, whether it's tech, trade, human rights, Taiwan, or the South China Sea. So adding more to that list isn't on the agenda in Washington. But more importantly, cutting supply of Iranian oil to China could potentially lead to a rise in global oil prices, and Biden wants to avoid that as he's entering an election year where prices at the pump are always a major consideration for voters. Supporters of expanding these sanctions argue, though, that there is actually enough supply outside of Iran for prices to be able to handle such a hit. Good to analyse all of that. Thanks very much, Charles uh, Pellegrin, uh, for doing that for us. We're going to have a look at the markets now, though, uh, starting with the oil ones. Aren't mm -hmm. uh, any concerns over uh, the future supply of oil uh, being restricted by increased sanctions on Iran are currently being outweighed by concerns over weak demand for oil, especially with weak indicators out of China for the month of March, and also with the U.S.'s rise in oil stockpiles. The uh, West Texas Intermediate and the Brent uh, benchmark both trading lower, as you can see. Let's also have a quick look at the stock market in Europe at the open. Uh, we're seeing a mixed picture as shares start the uh, session. This as U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell um, saying on Tuesday that the central bank needs to see more progress on inflation before it starts thinking about reducing interest rates. As a reminder, higher interest rates means borrowing for companies is more expensive, which means less investments, which generally tends to affect stock prices. Uh, U.K. inflation eased to 3.2% in March, slightly less than expected. And as you can see, the FTSE 100 currently trading flat on the back of that news. Let's take you to Canada for this uh, next story. The Liberal government of Justin Trudeau making its case to voters. Uh, new budgets they've got. Mm -hmm. The government presented the new plan in Parliament ahead of uh, elections where the opposition Conservative Party is leading in the polls. As Tom Kennedy is about to explain, they're targeting younger voters by promising to tax the rich and increase spending on education, jobs and housing. Down in the polls, Justin Trudeau's government is trying to win over young voters with a budget focused on cost of living ahead of next year's elections. The Liberal Party says it will raise taxes on Canada's wealthy. The taxable portion of capital gains above $181,000 will raise from half to two-thirds, which the government says will affect about 0.1% of Canadians and raise nearly $15 billion in revenue over five years. The job of our tax system is to lean against this structural inequality, to fund investments in the middle class, especially in young Canadians, by asking those who are benefiting from the winner-takes-all economy to pay 
a little bit more. More affordable housing also played a key role in the budget. Noting high rents and cost of living, the Liberals said many Gen Z and Millennials wouldn't be able to afford to live in the homes they grew up in. They can work hard. They can do everything their parents did and more. And too often, the reward remains out of reach. Canada is in need of about 4.5 million affordable homes, 3 million of those for low and very low income households, and 1.5 for moderate and medium income households. The national debt will increase to a record high of $1.3 trillion in the next financial year. The deficit, however, is expected to come in a bit lower than originally expected at $39.8 billion. That's it for the business segment, uh, Stuart. John, thanks very much. John Pellegrino, that's summing it all up for us. So we're